Since the Switch launched in 2017, there have been many different ways developers have found of jailbreaking the system and installing unsigned code. But only one of these methods was so powerful, so monumental, that even to this day, Nintendo haven't been able to do anything about it to get rid of it. And Nintendo are never going to be able to do anything about it and are never going to be able to get rid of it. And it was all caused by one of these. That's right, no mod, no uh, soldering, no need to install a mod chip, just a simple paperclip. If you have one of these and access to a computer and a vulnerable switch, then you can jailbreak your system. How? Let's get into it. Jailbreak, an instance of circumventing restrictions on access to any computer system or digital content. Can you believe that word is actually in the dictionary? When manufacturers such as Nintendo or Sony or Microsoft make a games console, the last thing they want to happen is for people to find ways to install unauthorized applications or unsigned code, as we call it. And the reason for this is they want to protect their intellectual property. They don't want people making free themes or having their own app store on the device that they don't control. And also, they don't want people to install apps they don't actually own or games they don't actually own. Software piracy. And these reasons are completely legitimate. If the end user can install unsigned code, there's nothing stopping them from bypassing security checks in order to install pirated software and pirated games. So why are people searching for exploits in consoles like the Nintendo Switch? Well, some companies offer bug bounty programs where they'll pay these developers for any exploits they find in their system. The first bug bounty program dates all the way back to 1983, where a company named Hunter and Ready offered a VW Beetle to anyone capable of finding a bug in their software. Also, some less scrupulous companies use the exploits to sell things like mod chips. And then along comes the Nintendo Switch. Now, although it may be obvious to a lot of people watching, Nintendo don't make the parts, or most of the parts, inside the Switch. For example, they don't make LCD screens. They get them from a company called Japan Inc. Technologies. They don't make the OLED screen either. They get that from Samsung. The battery management chip inside is made by Texas Instruments. The USB-C controller inside is by Rome. The Bluetooth chip is by Cypress, and so on and so forth, until Nintendo have sourced enough component parts to create a console design. And they test it as much as they can to make sure it works like it's supposed to and that you can't make it do things it's not supposed to do, like run pirated games. However, with so many components made by so many manufacturers all competing to be the lowest bidder for some of these parts, things get missed and bugs do get through. There's never a console released that's perfect that never has any software revisions to it. You've just got to hope if you're a publisher of one of these consoles, if you're Nintendo or Sony or Microsoft, that the bugs that do get through, the exploits that do happen, are able to be patched in software at a later date. And guys, if you're liking the video, please hit the like button down below. It's absolutely free, but it really helps this channel and shows me you're liking the videos. That brings us nicely to NVIDIA. Most important part of the Switch is manufactured by that American company. First unveiled at CES in 2015, alongside the original NVIDIA Shield TV, NVIDIA's Tegra X1 system of a chip is the brain of the Nintendo Switch. To compare its architecture to a traditional computer, this chip is the CPU, the GPU, and the RAM all in one place. Hardware hacker Kate Temkins and the team at Reswitched revealed they'd found a coding error inside the read-only boot ROM of this Tegra X1 chip that would allow the execution of unsigned code, aka code not authorized by Nintendo. The coding mistake created a vulnerability which, when booted into the Switch's recovery mode, circumvented the lockout operations that would usually protect the chip's boot ROM. By sending a piece of code to be executed of the perfect length and at just the right point in the USB control procedure, Kate and Reswitch discovered they could cause an overflow in the direct memory access buffer, giving them the opportunity to run unsigned code. And if none of that makes any sense, don't worry, let's talk about what that actually looks like in the real world. First, anyone looking to jailbreak their Switch would have to boot into recovery mode. This is probably the hardest part of the process for the end user. To get into recovery mode, they have to hold down the volume up and power button, all while electrically connecting pin 1 and pin 10 of the right Joy-Con rail. At first, when the exploit was discovered, people were using paper clips bent to the exact specification posted across a bunch of forums online to short these two pins together. Nowadays, pre-made RCM jigs or recovery mode jigs can be purchased, which slide into the right Joy-Con rail and connect these two pins together much easier. Next, now that we've successfully done that and we're in recovery mode, we need a device to connect to the switch via USB, which contains the code to be executed. This device will shake hands with the switch and transfer across to it the precise set of values we need to overwrite the stack and then trigger the vulnerability. The first proof of concept was developed by Kate and Reswitched to run on Mac and Linux, and later Windows programs such as Tegra RCM GUI 
and even Android apps such as RCM Loader were developed to fulfill this function using Kate's and the research team's initial proof of concept. And in 2021, the easiest way of injecting this payload is with some sort of portable payload injector, such as this RCM jig that I've got. Most people choose to use this exploit to launch a piece of software on the switch known as Atmosphere. Once booted into Atmosphere, the user has the option of running homebrew applications, which won't be subject to the same authentication checks, which are present in Nintendo's stock firmware. As a result, we're able to run unsigned code and enjoy all the homebrew applications that have been developed for this piece of hardware by both hobbyists and enthusiasts, such as custom themes, media players, save file managers. There's also versions of Android that can be installed on this unique piece of hardware. I've got a video where I talk about all the best homebrew applications you can install on this guy. So I'll leave a link to that down below and I'll also link it at the end of the video if you wanna keep watching this. When asked why she disclosed the bugs, she stated, Unfortunately, this bug affects a significant number of Tegra devices beyond the Switch and beyond even the X1 included in the Switch. I can tell you it wasn't fun to find a bug with such a broad impact. It significantly complicated the ethics involved. In the end, given the potential for a lot of bad to be done by any parties who independently discover these vulnerabilities, I thought it best to disclose them immediately and under terms that ensured the vulnerability reached the public quickly. Not accepted any rewards, money, bounties in exchange for this vulnerability. Accordingly, I've not signed anything regarding the vulnerabilities. I can honestly say I've never signed an NDA related to the Nintendo Switch and I don't currently have plans to. So what did Nintendo do in response to all this? Well, they couldn't really do anything, at least not for the Switches that had already been released. This was a boot ROM exploit, which means no one can make any software changes to it, not even Nintendo themselves, because if you could change what was on the boot ROM, then this device wouldn't be secure anyway. Nvidia manufactured a new Tegra chip, the Tegra X1 Plus, which they codenamed Marico, with the exploit patched and under the guise of a new better battery life switch, Nintendo quickly got rid of all the old exploitable Nintendo Switches with the old system on a chip and put the new Marico unit into all the new ones. Thus, they successfully stopped manufacturing these Switches with that exploit from around the end of, of 2019. But for the millions of units that were made before this date and purchased before this date, they're all still completely exploitable. And it's all because of some bad code in the boot ROM of the device, some really clever engineers that work for ReSwitched and Kate Temkins, and one of these a paperclip. That's it. Thank you so much for watching, guys. If you've made it this far in the video, you should hit that subscribe button, join the channel, and you'll be notified whenever I put out more videos like this. If you like the video, please hit the like button. Again, it really helps the channel out. Absolutely free to you. I'll see you in a second in another video.